Um, well, good morning, everybody. We're about to get started with our message, but I wanted to have a special prayer time this morning. Um, for the last couple months, we had a father and uh, a grown son that had moved here from Chicago, um, Rick and Avilio. They've been coming every single Sunday. Maybe some of you met them, but Rick, the son, um, took his own life this week, um, and it was just really sad, and he had been struggling with anxiety and schizophrenia, um, but we just want to pray that for that family. Avilio um, went back to Chicago yesterday. But I just want to be praying for that whole family, the Rivera family. So would you guys pray with me for that family? Lord God, um, we're so saddened by the loss of this brother that has been worshiping with us every Sunday, shoulder to shoulder with him. And Lord God, I had just, got, had just started getting to know him. Um, but Lord God, we just, just pray that you would um, have mercy on him because we all need that mercy. And it's by mercy alone, your mercy, that we are saved. And Lord God, we, we just pray that you'd be with that entire family, that you'd surround them with your love, that you'd help draw them in hope to yourself through this time. And I pray for all people right now who are struggling with depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, any other mental illnesses, Lord God, would you provide the help they need, the hope they need. Um, I, I just pray that we as a church would be able to welcome those people and love them and care for them. Um, and, and Lord God, just, just raise your spirits, find hope. For those people in you, let them find hope. And I pray that you'd be with us all this morning as we need redemption desperately. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So on a week like that, um, we need redemption, right? We need help. And I think a series like Redeemed that we've been doing through the book of Ruth is really important for such a time as this, right? So um, I hope that you guys have uh, appreciated this series so far. Today is going to be the fourth, the final, the finale of this series through Ruth because we need redemption desperately. And um, yeah, so I'm excited that we can finish this series. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Ruth chapter 4. We're going to finish that series. And before we jump into, uh, I wanted to invite you all again Sunday night. That's starting next week, remember? Okay, last Sunday we had our dry run, our test um, night, and it was great. We had a great group here. We're excited already for just that group, and we haven't even brought in anybody outside the church, so we're really excited. Invite your friends. So these cards on your chairs are not for you. You're supposed to give them to somebody. Even if the 9 a.m. is your service, give it to somebody, because maybe the 6 p.m. would work for their schedule. You know, you have different cards, or maybe you could share it on social media. Maybe you could invite them on social media. There's a lot of different ways to invite people. I invited every single friend I know, and I'm sure they're uh, annoyed by it, but hey, let's invite them. The worst they can say is no, right? Hey, it takes, you got to get rejected a lot of times. That's, that's okay with me, but it's worth it, so I want to encourage you to invite people to that. Next Sunday night, September 8th, we're going to launch that at 6 p.m. It's going to be a blast. I think we're going to have hot dogs and s'mores afterwards, too, so you early morning people, some of you might want to even come back. It's going to be fun <laughs> for that. Okay, you ready for Ruth? We need to be redeemed, right? All right, let's do it. Have any of you guys ever seen the show on A&E called Bad Ink? It's not a really great show. I'm not recommending it. But it's about <laughs> a tattoo parlor in Las Vegas. And, you know, they say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, yeah, except for when you tattoo it on your skin permanently. <laughs> and so this show shows these people come into this tattoo shop with really bad tattoos. And then the tattoo artist transform those bad tattoos into something better and more beautiful. And the most fascinating thing is that the ugliness that's, that was the original tattoo is still hiding there under the surface. It's still there, but it's been transformed into something beautiful that they're proud of. And I think that's kind of like us. You know, we have these pasts that sometimes are ugly and filled with difficulties and the past doesn't get erased, it doesn't go away, but just like those ugly tattoos, they can be, our past can be redeemed and transformed into something more beautiful. And that's what we're going to talk about today, that God can redeem all things. That's right. This is an incredible story of redemption. A few weeks ago, we were introduced to two women in this story, Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, and Naomi it was living in a desperate, terrible time. It was a time of fa famine, and because of that, there was starvation. And the family had to leave the promised land, leave Israel, go to Moab. And there, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died. Both her sons died. And she was left with her two daughter-in-laws. And then Orpah, one of them, left her. 
So it was just she and Ruth, and they decided to go back to Bethlehem. And that's when we were introduced to them. And because of all the grief and sadness and difficulties they'd experienced, they went back to Bethlehem filled with bitterness. In fact, that's what Naomi said was her identity. Uh, you know, I am bitter was her name from then on. But we learned even in that first message that only God can bring you from bitter to better. God has healing and redemption available. And then in the second week after that, we saw Ruth, because Naomi was too old to go out and work, Ruth was going out into the fields to glean whatever was left over from the harvest. She was basically dumpster diving, just eating enough, getting enough food to get by. And it was there that she happened, just happened to meet this man named Boaz, and we saw God's fingerprints all over that chapter of the story. And, and through that, we learned, too, that we can have confidence in providence, that God is working in all things for the good of those who love him. And we can trust him with that, and we can see his fingerprints in our lives that way. Then last week, Naomi came up with the bold plan to send Ruth into the middle of the night to go and find Boaz. But we learned that it wasn't a scandalous seduction, but actually a courageous marriage proposal. And so we were challenged by Ruth's example to be courageous without compromising. And her noble character prompted Boaz to step up, and he pledged he would do whatever he could to help those two destitute widows. But at the end of last week, there was kind of a hitch in the story, wasn't there? Because Boaz said, I will redeem you. I, I'm a close relative of yours. I have the right to redeem your lands. But there's a problem because there's actually someone who's a closer relative that has first dibs, the right of first refusal to buy the land from Naomi and redeem her. So Boaz says, though, okay, just, just stay here or actually go home to Naomi. I'm going to take care of things. And that's where we finish chapter 3, and that's where chapter 4 begins. And Boaz basically goes to work immediately. At first light, he heads to the city gate. And he just happens, once again, just happens to run into this closer relative. He's a man that's not named, but he's the closer relative, the man, the first dibs guy. And Boaz takes him and he grabs him and he says, okay, you sit here. He sits him down. And then he runs around and he finds 10 more elders in the town because they'd be witnesses. And he brings them to the city gate too. And the city gate was basically the public forum where business, where legal transactions happened. This was a courthouse in the ancient world. So Boaz, this man, and these ten witnesses are there because Boaz has some negotiating to do. And he's a wise guy. He's a smart negotiator. And like any good negotiator, you don't lead with all the information you know, right? So he says, okay, hey, he explains this issue with the land with Naomi's property now being up for sale. And he tells the man, so do you want to buy this land? And the man says, well, that's a great idea. <laughs> I would love to increase my property holdings. Yeah, it'll cost me some money to purchase this land, but if I can get more land, that'll be great, right? My business, my farming, it'll grow. And that's what he says. I'll redeem the land. And when you just read that, you think, uh-oh, I guess this budding romance is over. Boaz and Ruth are no more. Oh, too bad. But then Boaz brings out some more information that he's kind of been withholding, right? He says, oh, and by the way, if you buy Naomi's land... There's also this daughter-in-law named Ruth, who's young enough as a widow to still be married, so you've got to marry her too. Now, we don't know if this man was married or for some other reason, but when he finds that out, he says, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I have to marry her too? This Moabite? I don't think so. He says it would actually cost him something. It would put his family name in jeopardy. And this is probably because if he purchased the land, any heir that he and Ruth might have would inherit that land. It wouldn't be his, it would go to a Limelech's family clan, family name. And if he didn't have any of his own children, which he probably didn't, this would mean all of his land and his name would be gone too because it would get passed on to their heir. So he was putting everything at jeopardy if he marries this Ruth and he's like, I've got to bow out. No thanks, I'm not in. And Boaz had kind of done that with him like this sneak attack just so he would in front of all these witnesses say, no, I'm not interested. And Boaz got what he wanted because now it was time then for him to step up and say, fine, I'll do it. In front of everyone, I will marry this woman. I will pay to purchase Naomi's land. I will redeem this family. I will redeem them. And, and we can see even right here that all things, God can redeem all things. And then in verse 9 and 10, it goes on to say that Boaz purchased the land and redeemed Naomi and accepts Ruth's marriage proposal. 
We don't know for sure if they had a wedding ceremony. That was one of my questions in that. <laughs> I wanted to know that. Um, but they maybe had just, if the custom at the time was just a wedding party, so they maybe did that, but we don't know for sure. Yeah, we don't know, but we do know that the elders there at the gate give this great blessing on this new family. In verse 11, we can pick that up. It says, Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. When the elders pray for her, they're, they're praying for her to become like Rachel and Leah. They're praying a blessing of fertility upon her. And they're asking God to allow her and to have many descendants. Then they pray for her and her family to have standing among all the people, which is incredible because of where Ruth came from. She was a Moabite, a foreigner, which carried along with it stigma. She would have been a worshiper of Chemosh, which was the demon god and part of a religion that involved child sacrifice. But anyways, even though that's her past, they were still welcoming her and embracing her as one of their own. They were bringing her into the fold and even blessing her. And I just think it's amazing. She came so far from her days as a Moabite, from her sordid past, to being a praised figure in this new society. Yeah, you can see very clearly that God can redeem Ruth's past. God can redeem all things. And I think that's so important. We don't realize how difficult this would have been. A Moabite, somebody not part of the family of God, worshiped this demon, child sacrifice. This would be like someone who was an atheist or a Satan worshiper or part of some cult or like some polygamous cult. All of a sudden coming to faith in Jesus Christ, you're like, what the heck? You know, this is a major transformation. Some of you have stories like that, too, and you know what, what Ruth might have been going through because now they're praising her as one of the, the amazing women of Israel, like Rachel and Leah. This is a major transformation, and this is what happens when you come to faith. In fact, some of you have a story like that, and that's what baptisms are for, right? This is publicly saying, hey, look where I was. Now this is who I am in Jesus Christ. I have something new, and we have some baptisms coming up at the end of September, okay? Okay. So I'm just throwing that plug in there. If you have a story, if you're saying, I have decided to follow Jesus and you want to make that public declaration, you've got to do it. We'll dunk you, okay? Mark that on your connection card. But this is incredible because her past is now being redeemed, right? From a Moabite demon worshiper to one of the faithful women of Israel that will be remembered forever. I, I love that because we all have pasts. We have pasts, don't we? We've been through that divorce or the second divorce, or the third divorce. You know, we come from a family background. It's not very good. You know, maybe even our family was on an episode of Maury. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you feel that way about your family, like they should have been on that episode. We have these pasts we, because we went to prison. We have a record. We've been through a bankruptcy. We have all this stuff weighing down on us from the past. Well, guess what? God can redeem your past. He can take that and make it beautiful. God can redeem all things. And I think it's also interesting here what happens in verse 13. I love this verse. Could you read this with me? It says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. This is awesome because remember 10 years she was in Moab, married, no child. She was probably infertile, but not anymore. Yeah, God opened her womb. He healed her, and she gets to have a child, a son. When we were planning this series back in January, we had just grieved our way through three miscarriages, and I was pretty much in the dark night of the soul, and I, I felt a lot of the things that I imagine Ruth and Naomi were feeling in their time of desperation. And then in January, we became pregnant again, only to lose a fourth. And after that, I was reading Ruth's story, and verse 13 really jumped out at me, and I thought, God redeemed Ruth in the same way that I want him to redeem me. And the joy that they experienced through that just came through that verse for me. And then 
like a month later, I was pregnant again, and then a month after that, we were at the doctor, and they said, nope, there's one heartbeat, and now there's two heartbeats. <laughs> and when he said, okay, let's make sure there's not a third, I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> And one important verse to me through all of our stuff that we lived through was Isaiah 54, 1, and it says, Sing, O childless woman, you who have never given birth. Break into loud and joyful song, O Jerusalem, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband, says the Lord. I love that prophecy, prophecy from Isaiah because it's not actually addressed to a specific woman. It's addressed to all of God's people. And God is saying, you were barren, you were childless, but I'm going to give you a child. Now, God can redeem all things, even infertility, that he can do a miracle and, and even give a double blessing through it like we're experiencing right now. He, he can open up the womb. God has that power. But for some people, God provides redemption in a different way. Maybe it's through foster care or an adoption. God prov provides those opportunities, and they're beautiful and powerful. Or, or for some people, that they can have spiritual children, do you know how important it is for each one of us to have a child in the faith? Have you thought about that? Especially when you lead someone to faith in Jesus Christ, you are their spiritual father. You are their spiritual mother. And that's an incredible blessing and privilege and responsibility we have, just like having our own child. But God can redeem all things, even infertility. And I, we want you to know that. We want you to know that truth. God can redeem all things. So we see Ruth's redemption pretty clearly. Her past is redeemed. Her infertility is now redeemed. But there was another woman in this story, right? In fact, I wonder if this other woman, Naomi, is really the protagonist of the story. It's kind of she and Ruth at the same time. But Naomi was there from the beginning. She had experienced grief. Her husband and both her sons had died. Where is her redemption? And that's why we see what comes next really powerfully. In verse 14, it says, The women said to Naomi, these are the same women probably that when she first got back to town was like, I'm bitter, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me bitter. It says, The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. I love how it says she's better than seven sons. She has shown so much courage and integrity and character. She boldly went and proposed marriage. She worked hard day in and day out to provide for an elderly widow, leaving her culture and people behind. And yes, maybe Boaz played a part in the redemption of of Ruth and Naomi. He was a good man, but the admiration in, this ver in these verses is placed heavily on Ruth. To say that she's better than seven sons is a high honor. Yeah, this is really interesting because the critique of this book, the shallow critique, is that, oh, it just takes a man to swoop in and save the day. But no, it was Ruth that's the hero who's praised here. She was the one who was bold and courageous and proposed to Boaz. She was the bold one. She's the hero of this story, and it's because of her work that Naomi is now redeemed. She's redeemed now too. I want you to see verse 16. This, this is a cool verse too. It says, Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. Verse 17, The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. I love that verse. Can't you just picture Naomi, her gray hair, her weathered face, tears streaming down but this time it's not tears of grief it's tears of joy she's rocking this little baby in her arms smothering him with kisses as he coos can you just picture that it's beautiful and i've read this so many times and and i never noticed that it says that naomi has a son isn't that fascinating you know in the bible there are no mistakes i don't know if you knew that but there are no mistakes in the bible it doesn't say ruth has a son it says naomi has a son this is important because Naomi had lost two sons, and now these women are declaring, hey, this child is, is in a sense your son. She's getting to raise him and love him and cherish him as the grandmother. This is a beautiful redemption for her. 
Because her family line, her husband Elimelech's line is not cut off. It's not dead. It can continue on, and she gets to be a part of it as a grandmother. So we see in this that God can redeem all things, even our grief, even the past hurt that's been weighing down on us. Yeah, we may bear the scars of our past hurt and grief, and anyone who knows, who has lost a child or a spouse, knows that that pain never really completely goes away. But just like those ugly tattoos in that show, God can transform the pain into something beautiful, something praiseworthy. The past will be with us, but God can make it beautiful. C.S. Lewis said, God, who foresaw your tribulation, has specially armed you to go through it, not without pain, but without stain. The loss of your child, the death of your, in, a, in your family, the pain you went through because of a divorce, your brokenness can be restored. That's right, not without pain, but without stain. It's not permanent. There is redemption, no matter how much past hurt and grief you are carrying. And this isn't even the best part of the story. This is a pretty good chapter, isn't it? This isn't even in the best part of the story. Well, I want you to read what happens in verse 18. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. Do you know who that David is? It's not David Bowie. Okay. <laughs> this is King David. Do you see how incredible that is? You picking up on this story? The king who would unite Israel. King David was her descendant. Her great-grandson. I can just imagine Ruth's courage, this story being told from one generation to the next to the next, can't you? Of her bravery and her courage. And I wonder, you know, we can't know, but I can just imagine that on that day when David bent down and picked up five smooth stones from the riverbed, and he rose up courageously, to slay a giant? I wonder if this was the story going through his head, that he could have faith in his God because his great-grandmother had displayed so much courage. And this is King David, the David who was a great warrior, who wrote half the Psalms, a great worship leader. This is King David, the great benefactor to the nation. This was her descendant. Isn't that beautiful? But it gets even better. I want you to show you another genealogy, this time from Matthew. Matthew. You guys see this genealogy in Matthew chapter 1? Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. And then a little bit farther down on this genealogy. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. I think this is probably the best part of the whole story. Ruth the Moabite on that dusty road to Bethlehem made the most profound, history-altering decision. In spite of her grief and loss, she courageously went to Bethlehem. She said yes to God. She put one foot in front of the other and didn't ignore the prompting God had put in her heart. It was hard. It was a long journey, and it was definitely the dark night of the soul. But as a result, God used her to become the great-grandmother of David and in turn in the line of Jesus himself. She had no idea how profound that decision was that she made that day on that dusty road. But these women are part of the story of the redemption of the whole world. That's right, the redemption of the whole world. And we need that redemption because some of us are in those desperate, grief-filled places that we're still suffering and struggling. We don't know how long it's going to take us in our story. We don't see the Redeemer yet. But he's there because he was there all along. It was just planned that this Jesus would come one day. Um, there's a great quote. I've shared it before from Henry Nouwen. And he said that our cup is often so full of pain that joy seems completely unreachable. When we are crushed like grapes, we cannot think of the wine we will become. And sometimes it feels like our circumstances just remain unchanging and like we're kind of stuck. God is always there working behind the scenes. You can be sure of that. 
And every believing Christian's story has a redemptive end. He has a creative plan for redemption for every story. It may not be what we think, and if if the things that we hope for don't happen, we still have to just hang in there because he's a creative problem solver and artist of the first degree. And he can and will redeem all things. That's right. God can redeem all things. And I think this story paints that picture so beautifully. You know, a lot of times as followers of Jesus, we think of our redemption as the forgiveness of our sins. That our sins can be paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the cost. And and then our sins can be forgiven and wiped clean. Now, that is certainly part of redemption. I want you to look at Colossians 1.14 with me. Colossians 1.14, it says, In Jesus we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. But that passage does not stop there. Down in verse 20 of the same passage, it says, And through him to reconcile to himself, what? All things. Did you read that? All things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus' death, when he purchased our redemption like Boaz did, for Ruth and Naomi so many years ago. It cost something. It cost the blood of Jesus Christ there spilled on the cross. But it wasn't just for our forgiveness. That's a part of what redemption is. But it's really our whole story that can be redeemed. Our suffering, our grief, our trial. God can redeem all things. And it doesn't even say God can redeem some things. It doesn't even say most things, does it? No, it says all things. So, church, I want to ask you, Does all things include your divorce? Does it include uh, your criminal history? Does it include the brokenness that you felt? Does all things include that time that you actually sinned and you did something terrible? Yeah, that, that dark night where you did give in to temptation. Does all things include that? See, all things includes all those things. It includes our past, where we came from, our history. It includes the scars we are carrying. It includes our mental illness. It includes the suffering that we've been carrying, the grief that's been weighing down on us for so long. God can redeem all things. So as Bobby comes up right now, and and is going to lead us in a song, I want us to all know that God can redeem all things, no matter what it is. Did you notice, too, in, in Romans, it says that no thing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. No thing. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. God is working in all things. There is nothing beyond his power to redeem. There is no scar, no tattoo, no disgrace that is too ugly for God to make beautiful. God can redeem all things. So I want everyone to bow their head with me in prayer right now. Lord God, we have men, women, children here this morning who are struggling. We're carrying things from our past that are weighing down on us. Lord God, and and it feels like they're just so heavy that we can't make them better, that we've been waiting so long, our infertility, this grief we've been carrying, this loneliness of being single, Lord God, but you can redeem all things. We believe that, and we claim that today, Lord God. So I pray for the person here who's carrying a burden that you begin to show them that you are lifting it. Lord God, that they would turn it over to you in faith. And Lord God, that you would show them right now that there is redemption for their story because in all things, you work for the good of those who love you. You can open your eyes for a second. Now, um, I know some of you are wondering, well, hey, does that apply to my story? Well, let me tell you this. It doesn't actually apply to everyone. It only applies to those who in faith have turned to Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of all things. So some of you have never made that decision to follow Jesus, and I want to challenge you to do it today because God can and will redeem all things for you. But you must turn to Him in faith. That's why it says in all things, God works for the good of who? Those who love Him. It's for those who in faith have turned to Jesus Christ, the great redeemer, the one greater than Boaz, the true kinsman redeemer, our brother who laid down his life for us. So I want to give you the opportunity right now, if you've never done it before, to put your faith in Jesus Christ because that redemption is for you too. So would everybody close their eyes? And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I just want you to be praying for the people around you who have never made that decision of faith. 
And if you're here today and you're saying, Matt, I want that redemption in my life. There's something, there's lots of things, my sin, my past that is just weighing down on me. I want to see it redeemed, but I don't know how it could happen. If you're willing today to put your faith in Jesus Christ, would, would you just put your hand in the air right now? If you're here and you want to make that decision, just put your hand in the air. Everybody's eyes are closed. Lord God, I just op- I'll give this opportunity to these people who want to make a, a first-time decision in faith. Lord God, in their heart, they can call out to you because it says in your word that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So with that, these people here today, Lord God, I just want to call out in faith for your redemption, that you'd forgive their sins and purchase for them eternal life right now, that they can begin to walk in it and see their story redeemed forever and ever and ever. And I pray for all of us, Lord God, as we remember what you did on the cross, that bloodshed, that we would remember that redemption is coming, that you can redeem all things, even our things. I pray this in Jesus' name.